Good morning and welcome. Today we are uh, glad to have Blas Tampon back with us for her third part in her successful succulents. Today's will be What's Eating My Plants. I'm Laura Fleek with the Fresno County Public Library working out of the Woodward Park. Thank you for joining us so much and we've got a lot going on. So welcome Roz. Good morning, Laura, and welcome everybody. Um, I know it's gonna be a hot day. Maybe it's a great day for uh, being inside and checking out one of our uh, Zoom classes with the library. So thanks for being here today. Again, my name is Roz Tampone. I'm a uh, Fresno County Master Gardener. I'm also a member of the uh, Fresno Cactus and Succulent Society, as well as the uh, Cactus and Succulent Society of America. So let's get, um, let's get ready to see what's eating my plants. So the goals for today's class are to give you some steps to show you how you could rid pests on your succulents, I want to also talk about several diseases and pests that are currently in Southern California and are making their way up to the Fresno area. And then uh, the last goal I have is a, a table of uh, what's wrong with your succulents. And at that time, you may decide you'd like to take a photo of that one slide because it gives you a lot of information that you can have handy as you're attending uh, to your plants. So what's eating my plants? Uh, there are both pests that can be um, insects as well as abiotic things that can affect your plants. And when I talk about abiotic, I'm referring to things that are physical rather than biological. Uh, it's not derived from living organisms. For instance, uh, sunburn, and overwatering would be considered abiotics. And your pests would include things like your aphids, scale, mealybugs, snails, as well as birds and squirrels. So if you have pests on your succulents and you wanna get rid of them, um, there are a couple of steps that you can take. The first one would be um, as you're outside looking at your succulents, always examine them to see if you see something that may be amiss. So uh, if you do find something that looks like a pest or something that's really bothering your plant, then quarantine it from your other plants. You wanna use the uh, proper pest control and then you wanna keep a watchful eye on that plant and then repeat the uh, proper pest control if necessary. So, uh-oh, what's eating my plants? Over the last few years, there have been some major infestations of pests that have killed many beautiful succulents. Three that have attacked succulents in the uh, Los Angeles and San Diego area are the agave edema, agave snout weevil, and aloe mites. Um, if they're in San Diego and LA, they will be in Fresno soon and the aloe mites have already arrived. So the first one is agave edema. Uh, this agave franzonii uh, resulted from a pipe that broke beneath the plant. And you can see the damage that it caused on the leaves of the agave. It's serious and unsightly. The damage is permanent and it results from inconsistent watering. Uh, blisters form on the leaves and the skin starts to slough away. There's no reversing the damage on this. So check to make sure that large agaves that are outside in the ground are watered minimally and infrequently. Again, that's the damage that's caused from agave edema. Now, one that's even more devastating is the agave snout weevil. It causes this damage on an agave americana. So if your agave wilts and has dark patches at the leaf axils, it likely has the snout weevil. 
It's a thumbnail sized black beetle that punctures the agave's core and inserts its eggs. The grubs hatch, consume the core of the plant, turn it to mush, and then they tunnel into the ground to pupate. At the first sign of infestation, remove the plant and uh, so it doesn't move on to your healthy agaves. And then if you uh, want to plant some new agaves, plant them bare root only in pots atop the ground. So the agave snout weevil is serious and fatal. Prevention is essential. And you want to drench the ground beneath your agaves in your garden in the spring and fall with a systemic insecticide that's good for weevils. Now the aloe mite is probably even a more serious uh, pest because it spreads. And you can see the damage that it caused on this variegated aloe. There's no known cure for it. And it's a microscopic mite that causes a tumor-like growth on the aloes, especially on the leaf margins and the flower spikes where the leaves meet the stems. Once the mite is in a plant's tissue, it continues to cause a cancerous growth. So what you wanna do is discard that plant, sterilize the tools you use with bleach or isopropyl alcohol, and the reason for that is so you don't spread it to your other plants. Um, if you keep that plant, the aloe mite is still going to show up on that particular plant. So even though it may look okay, don't give the cuttings to friends from an infested aloe. This was a um, aloe mite infestation that I had on a tiger aloe. Um, I had purchased it in San Diego, brought it to Fresno. Um, it didn't show up for about three to six months after I had bought the plant and, uh, and came home to the Fresno area. But you can see the cancerous kind of growth that um, happens with that aloe mite. So this was the slide I was referring to for what's wrong with your succulent. So I'm gonna go through about 10 things that can be a cause of concern for your succulents. So if it has bleached leaves, it probably has gotten too much sun exposure. So move your succulent to the shade. If it has distorted buds, it could be aphids or thrips. And what you wanna do is spray with alcohol. And the alcohol that I typically use is the isopropyl alcohol at 70%. If it has cottony bits at the roots, it could be root mealybugs. Discard the soil, wash the pot, and repot your plant. If it has webs or paprika spite spots on it, it will most likely be red spider mites. Again, you can spray it with isopropyl alcohol. And uh, unfortunately, when we have our really hot summers in Fresno, those red spider mites tend to proliferate. Sometimes you can dislodge them by uh, spraying your plants with just a strong spray of water. And you can do the same thing with aphids. You can uh, usually dislodge them from the plant because, uh, I mean, with a spray of water. If they have sickly looking brown bumps on the stems, it's usually scale. And if it's the hard scale, you can scrape it off with your fingernail. If it's a soft scale, you can spray it with isopropyl alcohol. If it has holes in the leaves, it's usually snails or slugs. If you hand pick the snails or slugs and get rid of them, or you can use a snail bait on them. And uh, especially after a rain, you'll start to see a lot of uh, snails, 
especially around your aeonium succulents. If they have collapsed putty colored leaves, it's most likely frost. So you can tent your plants, use frost cloth, bring inside or shelter under a patio. If it has a squishy stem or trunk, it can be from overwatering. So take cuttings of your plants and repot them. If there is a loss of sheen or shriveling, it's usually underwatering. So water your plant thoroughly, keep the soil moist for a while. But remember from my previous classes, all succulents prefer a fast draining soil. If it has elongated leaves and um, it's just looking very leggy, it's usually from a lack of light. So you wanna give it greater sunlight. And if there's a greening of usually red or orange leaves, it's from pampering. So you can stress the plant with less water and more sun. If it has dry leaves around the rosettes, it's normal growth and you can peel them away. And from my earlier presentation, if you recall, I mentioned getting some uh, long handled tweezers. Those are perfect for getting inside or underneath your uh, rosettes where those dry leaves are. And your purpose for re removing those dry leaves is that's where mealybugs and other pests tend to reside. If it's a closed or shrunken rosette, it can be caused from heat, drought, cold, or dormancy. So move it under an, an, an eave and leave the plant alone. Now recall I said that it's good to get that isopropyl alcohol at 70%. This is what I use. I found a small spray bottle I have it filled with isopropyl alcohol. And as soon as I see aphids, mealybugs, cottony cushion scale, any of those things that are uh, on my plants, I take this out and I spray those uh, affected areas. And um, a really good bottle that you can use, because sometimes these little spray bottles, I want to say it's only five or six inches tall. Uh, ones that you can use if you see an optometrist and they always give you the um, glass cleaner. Once that's empty, that's a perfect bottle for using with your isopropyl alcohol. So here are a few slides of different kinds of damage that you're going to see on your succulents. The first one is some frost damage on agave. Um, and this agave is at agave attenuata. You won't find these on the more hardy succulents, but this agave is very frost tender. So you want to keep this protected during those cold mornings in the winter. Here you can see mealybugs on graptivarias, and you can see the damage that they've caused. They pierce into the skin. They suck the juices out of the um, succulents and create damage that's permanent. Here you can see aphids and ants on a cotyledon. And um, again, remember what I said earlier, you can either use your alcohol or a spray of water to dislodge it. And whenever you see ants on your succulents, there's usually another pest there because the ants are attracted to the honeydew that the pests secrete. Um, and here is a um, picture of what spider mites look like. Uh, this picture is taken from under a microscope because these things are rather small. Now, another way you can check for spider mites is if you see those webs or paprika-like uh, webs on your plant, if you hold a piece of white paper underneath a leaf and gently tap the uh, leaf of the plant onto the paper, if you see little red or brown dots on there and they start to move, that's usually a sign of spider mites. 
And one I wanted to show you because this is really something that happens to many succulents, especially on days like the last two days that we've had when it gets above 105 in the Fresno area, you get sunburn on your succulents and it causes a permanent damage uh, to your plant leaf. And you can see it here on a jade plant and you can see it here on a kiwi aeonium. So when you start to see your, sun, uh, your succulents get sunburned, definitely move them to the shade or move them under an awning or a patio or somewhere where they'll get less, less light and less direct light. But I also wanna show you what happens when it gets too hot. Um, in August of 2017, we had a really hot month. I can't remember exactly how many days above 100 it was, but these, this um, Aeonium sunburst, it got damaged leaves from it being too hot. And this was what this same plant looked like in October. I just... Um, moved it to a shadier spot in my garden. And uh, when it cooled down, the leaves that were damaged uh, ended up dying, but the new leaves will, uh, will still be very beautiful. And again, this was a sunburst daonium. The sunburst, the kiwis are, um, a, they're, they get more sunburn and react to the heat more than some of the thicker leaved uh, aeoniums. Now here's a healthy aeonium herbicum on the left and this plant, uh, sometimes they call it a dinner plate aeonium, it can grow up to about 20 inches across. Several years ago we had some hail in the Fresno area and um, I had taken this picture maybe about three or four weeks before I took this one. And I want to show you the damage that was done from hail. It's just these little black marks. But several months later, those hail marks, um, they actually went away and the plant looked more like it did originally. So the thing with hail damage is that it doesn't scar your plants permanently. And this is one that you'll find on cactus. It's called cochinea scale. And if you can see, this, these are the scales. And if you happen to press it, it uh, produces a red dye. It turns carmine red. And if you use a bathroom brush with a mixture of insecticidal soap, you can scrub off the scale and try to save your opuntias. And this seems to be only on those opuntia rabbit ear cactus. So do animals eat succulents? They do. And the uh, ones that are, that most succulent growers complain about are squirrels, possums, cats, and birds. Um, and in the spring, I find the soil of many of my plants disturbed by birds. There's soil all around the pots, and usually I find pecan seedlings growing everywhere from where the squirrels buried them in pots. And here you can see a squirrel eating some uh, cotyledons. They can be persistent garden pests. They climb, dig, and chew their way through anything to get their food. They take big chunks out of your succulents and usually leave telltale signs around your uh, pots. Uh, they leave jagged tear marks and deep wounds on the leaves. And if you put a peppermint plant beside your succulents, it may deter them. You can also use a pepper spray or sprinkle pepper around the plants. And uh, if you have dogs and cats, they can also deter your squirrels and birds. And your birds want to bury their seeds and nuts in the soil. 
Uh, remember that succulents store their water in their leaves and birds and rodents can get nutrition and extra water by eating the succulents. Um, birds are really hard to get rid of. Um, I have some friends that have called me and asked and the things that they recommend are putting up some scare devices, predatory decoys, uh, scary balloons, bird netting, um, or placing inverted baskets or crates over your plants while you're trying to scare them away. But unfortunately, birds find their way into your plants unless you have some netting around there. And if you'd like to learn more about specific um, pests that affect your succulents and cacti, the University uh, of Arizona Extension at this website will give you lots and lots of detail about the pest as well as uh, ways to rid them. If you'd like to take a photograph of this and have it uh, available for yourself, please do that now. So remember, some pests in your succulents and how to get rid of them. Examine your succulents. Quarantine them if they're affected. Use the proper pest control. Uh, keep a watchful eye and repeat if necessary. And remember when I showed you the, um, the scale and the uh, aphids? I have to use the uh, alcohol a couple of times to uh, get rid of the pests. But this is another excellent website. It's http colon forward slash forward slash ipm.ucanr.edu. And IPM stands for the Integrated Pest Management. And it's the uh, University of California Integrated Pest Management. If we have a few minutes today at the end of the class, I'll take you to a different website and show you how you can um, navigate that. So things you can do to help reduce the chance of pests attacking your succulents. Remove the dead leaves so bugs don't have a place to breed and hide. And removing the dead leaves will also reduce the chance of mold forming. Aim to keep your succulents dry because wet soil tends to attract the pests. Don't put dead leaves from infected plants into the compost pile. And keep your succulents strong during the growing season by using a mild and balanced fertilizer. But remember, it's at one fourth the strength of what they say on the package. And make sure your succulents have good air circulation, especially during the summertime. So are there any questions regarding the presentation today? Yes, we do have some questions, Roz. Uh, first, I do wanna answer everyone, let them know that these have all been recorded. The programs, um, if people wanna watch them, they can go to YouTube and Google Fresno County, Fresno, uh, Fresno County Library, Master Gardener. These are also going up on the Master Gardener website as well. So no worries, this program, if there's any information you wanna go back and look up, it'll be available to you in probably about a week or so. I uh, did have a couple, a question, uh, had a person ask, is alcohol better than neem oil? Neem oil um, is great for more of your shrubs. Um, I have never used neem oil on my, uh, on my plants, on my succulent plants, although my husband does use it regularly on uh, bonsai trees that are in pots. So I would recommend insecticidal soap or your alcohol for your uh, succulents. Okay, how about um, um, any thoughts on a shade cloth uh, for someone's succulents? You know, um, 
if you recall one of the uh, classes that I did where I was showing you an oak barrel, my oak barrel gets a lot of um, gets a lot of sun. And uh, when I get off of this class today, I'm going to put a piece of uh, white frost cloth across it to protect the uh, the plants. So yes, that would probably be be very good. As a matter of fact, um, my whole backyard is under 50 percent shade cloth. So mine get that regularly, but there are a couple of plants in my garden that get some direct sun where the shade cloth, I mean, where the sun just happens to hit it on an angle. So those I have to be more careful about for sunburn. But yes, you can use um, shade cloth. Okay, here's a good one. Is the alcohol spray diluted and should I wipe it off after spraying the leaves? Uh, no, you don't have to wipe it off. You want that alcohol to um, to kill the pests. And um, I'm sorry, Laura, read that first part of the question oh, again. So is the alcohol spray diluted? No. Um, when it was 100%, I did add some water to it. But now that most of the alcohol that you can buy is 70%, I just use 70% um, full strength. Oh, so the alcohol that um, I, I, isopropyl, <laughs> uh, where can you buy that? Is that something that uh, nurseries and places like that would all carry? No, you probably won't find it in a nursery. You'll probably find it at all the drug stores. I know Costco sells it and, you know, places like Target and things like that. Uh, Walmart would have it in their uh, pharmacy area. Oh, okay. Uh, are there succulents that don't get attacked by pests? You know, your hardy agaves, except for that uh, snout weevil, and you know, if you get that agave edema, they're pretty hardy. My Haworthias, I rarely ever see anything on the Haworthias. Um, the one thing I didn't talk about, and these are both um, aeoniums right here, but there are the little budworms that form into um, butterflies or moths, and uh, they do like the soft center of your rosette uh, aeoniums. And what I use for that is... Um, it's called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. And um, for any of your plants like petunias, uh, not gardenias, but your geraniums, they tend to get those little budworms, but these aeoniums do too. And so um, my husband's very good at treating the, um, the budworms that are currently on petunias and geraniums. And he always leaves me a little in our big spray uh, container so that I can spray the centers of the aeoniums. Um, is it better to have succulent plants indoor or outdoors? 99% um, of my plants are outdoors. You can grow some plants indoors. Um, but, you know, we have such nice weather here in California, you can keep them outdoors almost all year long. There are several that are, um, they may require frost cloth when it gets below 40 degrees, but for the most part, you can keep your succulents outside all year long. Uh, your Haworthias do well inside, your aloe, things like aloe vera, um, I may bring in a couple of my aeonium sunbursts, um, maybe in July and August when it really starts getting hot for, you know, two weeks on end where all those leaves will start to dry off. I can uh, bring them in the house, but the majority of my plants are outside. Okay. Um is there a crossover on the pests? You mentioned, for instance, the weevil, the mites. Are there pests that 
are just for, you know, tend to attack succulents, or is there quite a bit of crossover? So you'll see them in other plants, not just your succulents. Yeah, you'll see most of the ones that I talked about, except for that agave snout weevil and the aloe mite, you'll find those on just about every other kind of plant. Okay. Or shrub or tree. So if you're treating the um, succulent, you probably want to treat more, your other plants as well? Yes. Okay. Um, someone did, they said it's not directly related to the session, but I think it's a good question. Uh, what can I do with excess succulents? For instance, they have a huge four by four foot cactus uh, and they also have numerous offspring. Um, your friends would probably love them and they'd like the fact that they don't have to go to the store to buy them. Um, occasionally there are plant giveaways. Uh, Fresno State used to do one at the end of May. And I know there are some other organizations that do plant giveaways. Um, you could probably Google that in the Fresno area and see where, uh, when and where it might be. Uh, occasionally, um, I do this when I have too many plants and I have my aeoniums are going crazy, I'll take cuttings of them and I'll put them out in a box on my sidewalk and a day or two later, they're all gone. Okay, what would you say is your big old, biggest single threat to your succulents that you should be uh, looking for? Either pest, weather, um, overwatering, frost. Uh, what's your ongoing single concern? Well, whenever I see a pest on my plants, immediately I treat it with alcohol or try a spray of water to see if that dislodges them. In the winter time, when it gets below 40 degrees, I cover all my succulents. And sometimes I'll leave them covered when we have, um, you know, days that are in the 30s and 40s, I'll just leave my succulents covered for a couple of weeks. Um, but the biggest cause of death of succulents is overwatering. So if you're a beginning um, grower of succulents, I would really be careful of that. Make sure you have fast draining soil and you water them when they're dry. Um, you know, for most of the summer when we have degree, when we have temperatures like between 90 and the low 100s, I can get away with watering once a week. My, I can get away with watering my succulents once a week. When it's 105 and higher, I may need to water them twice a week. But remember all of my soil is that fast draining soil because you don't want your succulents to sit with wet feet. They'll get uh, root rot and your plants will end up uh, turning to mush. Hmm. Is alcohol treatment a one-time thing or daily for a certain amount of time? You know, that's where you really want to inspect your plants because if you see a big infestation, you'll want to go out there every day and treat it. If it's just where you see a few of them on there, usually one treatment will work for that. Let's see. Okay, um, Roz, I think we have enough time. You were showing me that integrated uh, pest management website the other day, and there's a lot to navigate, but I think it'd be worthwhile showing people, giving them an example. Uh, I love the pictures that can really walk someone through what problem they might be facing and how to solve it. Um, Laura, let me oh. finish with this presentation. Okay. And then, because I have just a few more slides on this one, and okay. then we'll uh, go to a different, because I want to go out to the website, to okay. the uh, UCIPM website. So let me finish the rest of the uh, presentation here. And I just wanted people to know this could be another um, page that you might want to take a photo of. This first one takes you to the Master Gardener website. The second one uh, takes you to the helpline where you can email questions on any garden concern. And the third one here uh, will keep you updated 
on gardening events that the master gardeners are doing. So if you'd like to take a, a, a quick photo of this slide, this will be helpful. Well, this is really helpful, good information. Uh, do I have any more and questions? Then, oh, and you can ask them as I'm, as I'm going through this, but we do have two more Zoom classes. Robbie Cranch will be doing uh, house plants on July 10th at 10 o'clock in the morning. And Sharon Matson will be doing hummingbirds in your garden on July 17th. Those are both Zoom classes. But we do have some other classes that we're offering. And these two bold ones, again, are Zoom classes. But on August 7th, Gwen Olshevi um, is going to be doing cool weather veggies. And that will be an in-person class at Woodward Park Library. September 25th at 10 o'clock, Anne Idal, if you saw her um, class on uh, herbs a few weeks ago, she'll be doing one on composting, and that's an in-person class. And then on October 10th, uh, that's a Sunday, that's the only day that's different, I'll be doing a succulent pumpkin demonstration at the Woodward Park Library. And to register for those classes, you can go to that fresnolibrary.libcal.com. Thank you, Roz. Yes, and we are very excited to start getting back in business and having in-person programming. So you can also call the library at 600-3135 anytime if you want some more information or visit our website. Um, let's and see. Laura... I also wanted to share the rest of the lineup for our fall classes. Uh, anything that has an asterisk on it is going to be the in-person at Woodward Park Library. But we're also offering a class on irrigation basics, on how to plant spring bulbs, olive curing, topiaries, propagation, wreaths and swags and that's the only class where there's a fee for that class and I believe it's limited to 15 people and one on tool maintenance. Now all these other classes without the asterisks are going to be done at the Garden of the Sun on winery right next door to the Discovery Center. Okay, absolutely. And just in, in conclusion I just wanted to share with you a few of my favorite succulents. Um, if you attended my first class, you saw some of my uh, rebutias. This one is the Sunrise Rebutia and the uh, Rebutia Carnival. And what I love about these small little cactus, they are the size of your thumb and not much bigger than that. But again, the Aeoniums are some of my favorite plants as well as the um, Echeveria agavoides lipstick, any of the Haworthias. And a couple of my favorite succulent crafts are the succulent pumpkins, the succulent Christmas trees, the strawberry pots, putting your succulents in your oak barrels. And um, I did want to ask one last question if people enjoyed these uh, Zoom gardening classes, would they be interested in other topics? And what other topics would they be interested in? Because I, I along with Melanie Sarkissian, we organize our adult education classes for the public. And we always wanna know what people want to know more about. And hopefully we can find a master gardener willing to teach that class. So if you have some of those ideas, maybe you can put them either in the question answer or the uh, chat. And then Laura, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop this share and I'm gonna go back out and share um, a different screen. Okay.
And thank you everyone for attending. I know it is miserably hot inside, outside. <laughs> I hope it's nicer inside for everyone today. Uh, and thank you, Roz. This has really been a great program. I've enjoyed it and learning a lot from, uh, you know, just some basic treatment and what's going wrong in my yard. <laughs> yeah, and this one, if anyone Googles UCIPM, it'll take you to this home page of the um, integrated pest management for, this is for all of California. And I wanna show you on this home page, there are four different areas. The home garden turf and landscape pests. This is where most backyard gardeners are gonna to wanna to go. This is if you're a rancher or a farmer and it talks about agricultural pests in a, um, in a bigger format, natural environment pests and exotic and inv invasive pests. But I just wanna take you on a little navigation of this home garden turf and landscape pests. If you double click on it, it takes you to the next slide and hopefully everybody can see it. It talks about pests of the home, structure, people and pets. And those would be pests that sting, bite, or injure, injure uh, folks, wood destroying pests, vertebrae pests. But this is where you're going to want to focus pests in your garden and landscape. So if you have a question about specific flowers, fruit trees or nuts, lawns and turf, trees and shrub, vegetables and melons, this is where I would go. Now you can also get more information from some common pests. Here we'll talk about uh, some vertebrates, some invertebrates, some plant diseases and weeds. Uh, this is great. It's a great place to go. But um, Laura, you and I were talking uh, yesterday mm -hmm. and I had mentioned to you that um, some questions that frequently come into the Master Gardener head, uh, helpline are on uh, vegetable growing. So I want to take you here because you can see all the different vegetables and melons that um, they have information about. But one that's common is about tomatoes. And it's about that brown rot that you get at the end of the tomato. And that is called blossom end rot. So um, once I've gone into tomatoes, I try to look, I can see the different kind of um, invertebrates that will attack my tomatoes. There's also, let me get rid of that for a second. You can see there are diseases of tomatoes, but this blossom end rot is really a common one. So let's go there. This is what that blossom end rot looks like. And the reason for it is uh, blossom end rot results from a low level of calcium in the fruit and the water balance in the plant. And what it's usually caused by is inconsistent watering. One day you water well, one day you forget about it, and then all of a sudden you'll get this brown end rot on the bottom of your, uh, of your tomatoes. So one other thing that I'd like to share is if you go to the left side of this link, you can see the weed gallery. And um, a lot of times, you know, we know we have weeds. We don't have any idea of what they are or how to treat them. But there are four different kinds of weeds. There's broadleaf we weeds, there's grass weeds, there's sedge, which are usually triangular in cross section and then there's aquatic ones. But if I wanted to, I could uh, click on identification and it will give you a lot of the different weeds that are growing currently in your uh, yard. And if I went to, let's just go to clover. Um, it'll tell you a little bit about that and tell you what you can do 
the mature plants and how it uh, reproduces and stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to share a little bit about that UC IPM website, but I really recommend if you have problems with anything in your garden, if you go back to the home, garden, turf, and landscape pests here, you can usually find what's bugging your plants. Well, I have to admit, Roz, after you showed me that, um, I kind of got lost down the rabbit hole at the website. It was a lot of fun uh, exploring and going, oh, I recognize that and that and not realize, you know, that that's what I've been dealing with. So there is, it is kind of fun. It's a fun site to explore and I hope people do so. Um, please continue your recommendations on any programs you'd like to see in the future. We've got some good ones coming in. Sunflowers, um, roses, gardening with children. Uh, someone talked about vegetables. We did have a very good program about a month, five weeks ago um, on vegetable gardening. Uh, we can always have different um, programs also on vegetables. I'm sure there's a lot we can cover. There was another question. Kim. Laura, that one that, um, mm -hmm. that uh, Gwen is doing in, um, in August is on cool weather veggies. Ah. So those will be your plants that will um, you can harvest during the winter time. And those might be things like some of your herbs that you can plant, um, pumpkins, um, your potatoes, beets, carrots, and things like that. Uh, this year, due to uh, COVID, we didn't do two of our vegetable uh, classes that are usually held in person at the Garden of the Sun and very, very well attended. One is on uh, spring vegetables that you harvest during the summer. And the other one is on uh, just a whole class on tomatoes. So we will offer those next spring. So those will be taken care of. But if you have other Zoom topics that you're interested in, uh, you can even uh, suggest those on the helpline. Laura, did you have some others? Uh, let's see here. This is an interesting question. I'm surprised this didn't come up actually in one of our uh, other succulents is, are bees helpful for flowering succulents? Yes, as a matter of fact, if you recall, let's see, maybe I can go and share one of my screens again on this one. Because I remember and we discussed go, ladybugs, and, um, but we didn't talk about bees. Yeah, the bees are wonderful. And um, I just want to show you one of the slides. This one right here, this is a aeonium flower. And for over a month, I had bees circulating around this. And way in the back over here, I have my tomatoes growing. I'm convinced that the bees that were on this plant also help pollinate my tomatoes. And I've just had an abundance of tomatoes that I've been able to share with folks. So yes, uh, bees are wonderful. They, um, I didn't do a whole lot on flowers of each of the succulents, but you will find hummingbirds going to your uh, aloes, as well as bees going to um, your other flowers on your succulents. Well, Roz, I want to thank you so much for these three fabulous classes you've done on succulents. Um, I love all the information you've given us, and you've been so knowledgeable and so gracious with your time. Thank you. And I know all our attendees have really enjoyed your classes as well. So I did want to send out our appreciation and I'm hopeful that we can have you back again. Well, I'm looking forward to the uh, succulent pumpkin demo that I'll do in October. And, um, you know, just keep on going on the Master Gardener website, the library website, the partnership that we now have with the library and doing these Zoom classes. We just get to reach a lot of folks and, um, you know, from the comfort of your home, you're getting educated. So 
I think it's a wonderful partnership that we have. So Laura, thank you for, um, you know, working with us and um, allowing us to do our PowerPoint presentations for the public. Oh, I love it. As you said, it's really nice to be able to uh, broaden um, our audience and be able to reach out to people who might, might not be able to attend. So thank, every, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, Roz, any last comments or advice or about upcoming programs? I think we covered a lot today. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just show you that one last slide again on the classes that we're doing in the next couple of weeks. So uh, if you haven't taken a photograph of this, that will help remind you to uh, sign up for those uh, classes at the library or on Zoom. So thank you again, Laura. I hope everybody stays cool today. And I was so glad that so many people attended our um, presentation today. I did too. And I've got some uh, repeated questions. Yes, we do record all of these programs and they will end up on the Fresno County Public uh, Library YouTube and they will go to the Master Gardener website as well. So be patient. It can take a week or so to get them up sometimes, but they will be there. If you need some help, feel free to contact the Master Gardeners or the library. We'd be happy to help. Thank you for coming today and everyone have a good day. Thank you again, Laura. You're welcome. Thank you.